Hello and welcome. And they say if it's good, then it must happen at least twice. Now, last week, we started a discussion which was based on uh, the IGP's incentive of cleansing the Ghana police of bribery and corruption, at least the perception of it. And in the discussion, we found out that it was getting broader and broader. And one thing that kept, you know, became prevalent in the discussion was our human rights. Some of us don't even know our human rights. Maybe the police is supposed to teach you. Indeed, what's the process of getting uh, a bail? Uh, what's the process when you get stopped from uh, speeding? Uh, what's the process when you get stopped from uh, speeding, when you don't have your driving license with you? What are the proper procedures? Now, these questions came up. So we thought as part of education, we must continue this discussion. And beginning of the week, uh, most of us will be traveling and have plenty traveling uh, agendas in the pipeline. So today we are going to continue to find out what is your right what you meet the police now with me in the studio is uh mina mensa who's uh, uh africa regional coordinator for commonwealth human rights initiative and also chief superintendent na hamza yakubu who's also the kunkwa naba and the commanding officer of the formed police unit uh joining us on the phone later will be gifty and in butchery who's a retired police Commissioner, my name is Nana Sakwao and this is PM Express. Hello, cleansing the Ghana police. But then we need to actually cleanse our own selves as well and know what our rights are and when to demand them, when to uh, stamp your feet on the ground. And that little clause of, if I don't do it, he's going to waste my time. So let me just do it and get on with it. But we're going to start with bailing because I know most of you have had serious challenges in bailing. And again, we will look at remand. Oh, the judge says I should keep you in cell for another two, three days. We're going to look at all those things and find out. Come onto Facebook and put your complaints on there. Maybe you've had some experience. Put it there. And since uh, Konku Anaba is here, he would help us with the education. Mina is also here to fight your corner for you. So today you're all, we're all sorted. <laughs> Vina, I'll start, with, uh, I'll start with you, so we push a few complaints uh, to my senior brother and find out why. And now I'm going to start with driving. Now you get stopped and you say, oh, unfortunately I don't have my driver's license with me. Are you, you know, are you allowed to, actually no, let me, so on, I'll, start, I'll start with you. Are you allowed some grace period to go and get your license or there and there, the car should be seized and... You know, what's the procedure? Because most people go through this. Well, uh, this is a situation uh, which will be dependent upon the circumstances under which you are accosted by the police. Mm -hmm. And so it is not an outright authority of the police to just impound your vehicle. It could really end up in the vehicle being impounded, mm -hmm. but then they ought to be very cogent, reasonable reasons why a police officer would go to that extent. For instance, a police officer stops you. He says, uh, let me see the documents on the vehicle. There are no documents on the vehicle. He proves further and he has cause to reasonably suspect that the vehicle could be tainted with some crime. He has all the authority to have the vehicle impounded until you produce the documents. Now, I see we're talking about documents here, but then you premised uh, your, your talk with um, the driving license. 
A police officer across you, let me see your driving license. If you are unable to produce the driving license, what the police officer has to do is to give you 24 hours to produce the license. That is conditional as well. If he so wishes for you to produce the license to or at the nearest police station. What will be some of the conditions? The driver looking gentlemanly enough, it's a lady driver, so maybe she's law abiding. What will make the incidentally incidentally there is this known fact that appearances are deceptive. Mm -hmm. You don't look at faces. If you do that, then you tend to be selective, mm -hmm. or you would end up being a very poor, uh, indiscretionary use of uh, police powers. Mm -hmm. All you need to do is to absolutely satisfy yourself that, yes, this person is actually somebody. For instance, I stop you. Mm -hmm. You don't have all these documents. You are able to prove your identity. I mean, I have the discretionary power of saying that, okay, uh, Nana, it's somebody who would certainly not run away. Mina is associated with a reputable uh, organization. And so I can then say maybe go and produce with, uh, within this period. And that discretion, I think, would be founded on sound reasoning. But where it is, is that there are no basis, nothing to let me believe in your identity. I think that any right-thinking policeman ought to have the vehicle impounded. Is it fair to also say, and, uh, come on Facebook, I mean, if, if uh, the taxi drivers suffer the brunt of this the most, because if you dare drive in your taxi and you've dropped your driver license anywhere, you might as well forget it, because that day you are going to be in absolute serious trouble. Do commercial drivers suffer In fact, more? I think commercial drivers do not suffer so much in this direction because these are vehicles that are often available on the streets. In the use of discretion, you would see that the possibility of a private vehicle having been stolen, mm -hmm. it's more higher than a commercial vehicle on the street. And so I don't think that uh, um, I think the commercial drivers would suffer more in this uh, respect. Because you can always have names and addresses of vehicle owners there. And so it's easier Nina, to I want deal you to come in here. That. I don't know if you want to comment on the driving license before I move into bailing. But yes, I I'm would. sure you... Let me hear. Yes, on the driving license bit. Um, Na said if you stop a person, if you're a policeman and you stop a mm -hmm. person, you have that discretion. Yes, you do have that discretion. But I also know that the discretionary powers shouldn't be used capriciously. Now, on what basis are you saying that you are impounding somebody's car because subjectively you think that the person cannot prove that the car is his or whatever? Secondly, about driver's licenses, mm -hmm. it is true that um, it is a discretionary um, power that the police can or uh, should be able to say they, they, they are taking your licenses or not. But at the end of the day, you should prove within, beyond reasonable doubt that there's a need for you to do that. Secondly, the law requires you to deposit it at any other police station within 24 hours. And even th these days, at first, the police were not allowed to take licenses. There was no law backing them. In recent times, you should be at least at the rank of inspector. So if a copra is collecting my license and I don't want to give the pay, because the law does not allow a corporal to collect my license. I don't see anywhere in the current... Um, no, I want you to... That, that cannot exactly be true. Mm -hmm. I am a police constable. I stop a vehicle. The license has expired. I need to retain it for evidential purposes. But the license well, belongs to expired. DBLA. It does not no, belong to the police. No, it does not belong to the DBLA. They are the issuing authority. But it does not belong to the police. No, certainly and the there police. Are certain, a lot of instances where policemen have collected people's licenses. I am not disputing them. that fact so that policemen do not collect licenses. And in some cases, they do so, like you said, capriciously yes. in the exercise in of case, their discretion. But then... What it's so patent is that 
once there is an offense committed in relation to that uh, um, driving license, the police officer, no matter what his rank, has the uh, authority. Now, if a constable finds that your license has expired, he takes the next three distance, then he gives it to you to go away, the policeman would have been the most stupid policeman on earth. That is the basis of any successful prosecution. He has to retain that license and to be able to present it before a competent court. Now, is it in the, in the new law? Because as far as I know, it is not in the new law that you are supposed to book the person, take the person's details. If the police does not have structures to monitor to ensure that the person does not appear in court, then the police should get the law changed. Because as far as I know, I have not... I stand to be corrected. Sure, but surely, as far certainly, as I, I know it is not in the law. No, certainly what I'm telling you is that the, you need to present evidence before every competent court before you can gain a conviction. And now in this case, where is the evidence? No, the the evidence, evidence is the document on upon which you are laying your charges. No, but the evidence but it should is the be based date, on law. The, the, the what the law uh, uh, allows you to do. Not because it's convenient for the police. It should be based on what the now, law now allows be, be, you to Maybe we would require some education from a okay. lawyer on this basis. I am not but a the lawyer. Truth, <laughs> the truth of the matter is that if I put somebody before a court, on mere allegations without a proof uh, now, then i'm not being a good police officer now if if you caught me on monday yeah. with an expired license and sure. you booked me for court uh, because i'm a driver i need to go on tuesday to get my uh, license renewed however when i turn up in court I'm still guilty because as of Monday, my license had expired. Oh, I'm surprised you would uh, just assume that you are guilty. Somebody no. comes to court, well, somebody would come to court and contest this. But now, the, no, no, the, DVLA has, the DVLA has documentation on a, a person's license. And whenever you take the first, you take the records of it. There's the number. You can always contact uh, now, them unless you for say the that, un, Now, unless you're no, saying that. No, you can always do that. That, that. that is not... The state of the law is that present the evidence, the physical evidence. So you mean what the DVLA will give you is not the physical evidence? No, what are they giving you? What they have given to the driver, it's the document you are going to present before the court. But they have records Hold showing it. The, you need the to show it. Date. Hold it. <laughs> if the person is contesting the case and it has to go through a full trial, mm -hmm. in the course of the trial, in taking evidence, everything that the police is basing its argument on will it's then the now be is presented it, to the it's court. The date it's on the license. No, no, no. Please, the hold on. please hold on. Will be presented before the court as the, the exhibit. The court would accept it if the. Uh, the accused or his counsel will look at it, raise an objection or agree that it should be accepted into evidence, then it is taken into evidence. When it is that a judge is writing his judgment, he is going to look at the material particulars on that document and include those facts in his summing up. So there is no way you are going to let that evidence go. No. You still can get the evidence because, for example, you have arrested me. I need to drive. My license has expired. You have taken my details. Even if I go and renew the license, it will show when I renewed it. So I can present it when I come to court so that I can drive if oh. I have to. I think so you, I are, you are looking at it in so simply take a, a term. Because well, the law does not allow you to do that. That's the law why. allows <laughs> you to produce evidence. Now, yes. Uh, now, now yes. before I move on, if I'm arrested today for driving with an expired license, and so the policeman takes it. Am I allowed, I have, do I have to board commercial cars until such time a judge tells me to get my license and go, or do I, can, I can continue driving? No, in fact, these are offenses where you see, you find that immediately upset people are picked up. Even in most cases, the MTU personnel would ensure that if it's possible, they would send you to court that same day. Okay. If it's possible, mm -hmm. if as much as possible, they would do that. But these are some of the reasons why we used to have these moto courts to facilitate okay. yes, those things so that you don't unduly uh, delay somebody. 
But um, now you are talking about an expired license. That's different from a license that has not expired and the person is suspected to have committed a motor traffic offense. And the fact that you are suspected for having committed a motor traffic offense doesn't debar you from driving because you are a suspect. No, I have, so why do you I have, I have not said, I don't think I have uh, I've said so. If, even though, even no, though because that is where we started from. It was mm -hmm. not about an expired license. It was about the seizure of licenses. And I think mm -hmm. I adequately explained the circumstances mm -hmm. and stated, yes. So in cases where people's licenses are taken, when the license has not expired, no, no, no. What like, about that? I, I, I think I made an admission that it's wrong. Okay. If you can, we have a process form. The person is processed. Everything, it, my license is not expired. My insurance documents, there is no reason why a police officer would retain those ones. For what reason? They are not connected with anything. And you will deal with the person based upon the offenses that you have uh, detected. Simple and short. Mm -hmm. you, you would only have recourse of uh, retaining them where the documents have expired. Okay. The, the, the it's other, just okay. that simple. Now, okay. now let me now move on to those uh, who peel the, uh, the, 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 the sticker off. As soon as you park the car, they peel the sticker off. So now the taxi drivers are trying to put the sticker right <laughs> in the middle so that you can have easy access to it. Uh, is that right or wrong so that we educate? Can you give me any reason why, you, you, if you have experienced that, well, why I, you, why uh, well, you well, do that? Well, I, I don't drive a taxi, so I, no, but it's, it's normally happens to taxis. And the reason why I know is I have a lot of if taxi friends. If it is a genuine and a valid one, it is wrong. I don't see why a police officer should do that. I see. If it is a genuine and valid one. I am aware that uh, DBLA have complained a number of times that there are fictitious uh, stickers mm -hmm. in circulation. No, I'm just talking there's about no doubt. Yes, or, or, there's no or, or. doubt about that. Mm -hmm. So if a police officer finds one displayed on a windscreen, yeah, you will be justified in having that removed uh, as uh, uh, evidence. Well, your, your men are now using as a means of detaining yes. No, cars. no, no, no. It's wrong. Because it's you, you, are, you are not able to drive away it's until absolutely you will wrong. For it. mm -hmm. It's absolutely wrong. If the thing is valid and genuine, it's okay. absolutely wrong. Uh, and now I'm going to move on to bailing, because that's also another uh, headache. And I'm not even going to say anything. I'll let me now, because you go through a lot of issues when you're bailing. So uh, now it's here. Uh, what are some of the challenges we go through bailing? Um, one of the challenges that people talk about is some, and the issue of sureties. For example, somebody. Um, is arrested and the person that would stand surety is a woman I know for a fact that for certain places the police have actually done a bit of work letting women know that yes you can be a surety but I know for a fact that for certain places women are not allowed to stand as sureties number two I also know for a fact that monies are collected for bail for, from certain people Another area that there are challenges is that sometimes for very minor offenses, people are not granted bail on the practice that they don't have sureties, but they're self recognizance bail. So if the crime is not, for example, uh, there's a, what do they call it? You know, when uh, public, oh, there's this uh, particular crime that. Causing public nuisance. Causing public nuisance, for example. And the person, sometimes the person is there for two days, over two, three, four days. And the argument from certain policemen is that he doesn't have a surety. And for such an offense, you can't give the person self recognizance although it's a discretionary um, uh, thing that the police normally do. So these are some of the challenges. So you find people in there who could have been granted bail, but because of the fact that they do not have sureties. And sometimes they keep them beyond the 48 hours. And then immediately the surety comes. Or for some of them, they don't even ask for the surety. And they say that, oh, okay, go. Then what was the point of not allowing the person to go in the first place? So these are some of the 
the challenges. But the key thing is paying for bill because that is a key thing. And you talk to some people and they tell that, oh, me person me can because I'm here no matter have a family. So yes, they collected, but I don't want to come out and say it. I'm telling you in confidence, if you call me, and they tell you, I'm telling you in confidence, if you call me, I'll deny. They tell you, if you call me, I'll deny, because I don't want a situation whereby it will come for me again. Now, what, what's the procedure now if, uh, if you, know, you need to bail a relative or a friend uh, from, from a sales? Like uh, she rightly said, this issue about women, women are not debarred from bailing anybody. They have equal rights as men to stand as sureties. And in, the in time past, it's true, people used to say so. Even sometimes in some courts, you go and at the registry, you are told that, uh, oh, you are a woman, you are not supposed to. But it had no legal basis or foundation. Now, the police itself has acknowledged the fact that Personnel of the, some personnel of the service has taught monies from sureties before they allow them to sign the bail bond. It is for this reason that there, is, there are instructions, and you find in most police stations, boldly printed there, bail is free, do not pay anything. It's there. Clearly. So this should tell you that the police itself is much aware and that we are taking steps to make sure that this is not done. The issue of self-bail, which we call self-recognizance bail, it's something that one ought to be very careful. Most of the reasons why people often accuse the police of being corrupt and it's Petty, petty crimes. For instance, at lorry stations, travelers, when they are on the move, they fall victims to pickpockets. Sometimes the pickpockets are arrested. The traveler gets on with the journey. The uh, pickpocket is brought to the police or the police is around. They bring the person to the police station. You cannot go ahead to prosecute. There is no way you are going to be able to achieve any successful prosecution. Then ah, they are resisting. The police are taking money. In some cases, the victims would come, but because they suffer no loss, they go and they don't come back. So it gives the police a very hard situation to take a decision as to the way forward. You go to court, you are going on the wrong premises. And so eventually you would have to let go. Then there are all sorts of um, allegations. Sometimes the person, it's a non-entity of no fixed address. There is evidence to go ahead to prosecute. You cannot immediately go to court. Then you are left in a dilemma. What do you do? You can't give such a person self-recognizance bail. Yes, there are human rights, but at what cost? Are you going to encourage the person to go carry on with nefarious activities? What about the victim? How are you going to restore the victim to uh, his or her proper um, status by way of losses? And so we find ourselves there there are petty, petty offenses, yes. Very good. Oh, but then you need to be very, very, very careful about how to go about it. If you just want to say, oh, this is just a small matter, give, um, what is it called, um, self-recognizance bill. You do. The person goes, he does not come back. The complainant comes, I'm ready to pursue the matter. You I cannot take, produce the person I take a break here, and we'll sanction you no, for when that. When I come back, we don't find out the, the, there's a fine line between systems, convenience, and human rights. Because it's like, well, I don't have the structures to follow you. Therefore, forget about your human rights. Where do we find the balance? Stay tuned.
the fine line between convenience and human rights. So here I'm a, I'm a police officer. I know I can't hold you for 48 hours because it's against your human rights. But then if I let you go, there's no address systems in Ghana. You don't have a mobile phone. I can come and pitch camp in the kiosk or wherever you stay uh, to make sure that you come back uh, the following morning. So then I infringe on your human rights. And we are saying, so uh, where do we find the balance? I'll start with you, Mina, because that's the excuse. So your rights will be infringed upon because the police officer cannot you know, follow you about. So in that case, what suffers is your human rights. Now, where do we draw a balance of being brutalized and being fair or unfair? That's a very difficult situation. But then, I guess for human rights to be really enjoyed, the police should be the ones to ensure that people enjoy their human rights. So that if the laws are such that um, you, the policeman, you are put in a situation where you have arrested somebody, you don't have enough evidence to hold him. Because if you have enough evidence, then take him to court. And even if you don't have enough evidence, there's a way of going about it. You take him to court, present what you have, and if the judge feels that on the basis of what you have presented, you need more time, normally they will give you more time to do that. The challenge arises in a situation where the courts are staggered. For example, in Medina, there are days for criminal offenses, there are days for civil offenses. So the excuse a lot of policemen use is that I arrested you today, today there is no court, tomorrow is not for criminal offenses. So probably the criminal offense day will be um, for, for, for Thursday or so. So I keep you in there till Thursday. As far as I know, like I said, there are certain crimes that are bailable. If it's a bailable offense and the person has a surety, why don't you let the person go? If it's not a bailable offense, that is where the challenge is. Because bailable or non-bailable, you still have 48 hours. If it's not a bailable offense, take it into court. So that is where the challenge is. But under no circumstances should people's human rights be abused for the sake of convenience because the systems are not working. Somebody has to pay for it. And under no circumstances should that happen. I'll just take some of the... Uh, uh, now somebody wants to know, uh, said, please, what is formed police unit? Even though the next guy comes to answer, he says, Jalid, uh, Baba Musa says, Jalid, I think it was formerly called Ahmad's Car Squadron or so. Uh, I'll get now to uh, confirm that for you. Uh, Mena Akwa says, uh, when you report a case to the station, ex uh, expecting the police to bring in the suspect, the first question they ask you at the station is, are you ready? Or did you prepare before coming? In other words, they expect you or either the foot, or either for to cost, uh, foot the cost uh, by bringing the person in. Is this right? Uh, Baba Musa Tamale says, under what circumstance can a suspect refuse to cooperate with the police officer who is handling him on her? Uh, Boklo Mimi Gertrude says, uh, one, is it ethical in the police force for a policeman to travel all the way from Agbogwa in a Mufti to go and arrest someone in Teshi? If it's fine, uh, then no. And if it's not, where can we lodge a complaint uh, for him to be taken to book? And this is uh, Gertrude. Uh, John Singh, or being Ampofo, says, at what time are the police supposed to handcuff someone who is under arrest? Uh, ben Frank says, those policemen arresting you do not know anything about human rights. They only train to brutalize innocent persons. Just take a look at what happened at, uh, in, in one of the banks. So that's public perception there. Uh, Thompson says, why do the police demand money before bailing a suspect? And I think uh, you've answered that. Get to the name comes in and says, in civil case, is the plaintiff invited for questioning or arrested as a criminal? If, it is, if, if it's invited, then please your office should remind the office of this. And this is coming from Getrich. You can tell Getrich has really struggled under some police brutality. Under what circumstances can one be handcuffed? I think people want to know, uh, you know, when one can be handcuffed or not. Well, uh, let me 
maybe take them one by one. Mm -hmm. A police officer in Mufti going to affect an arrest is normal. Yes, it's normal because a detective is clothed with the powers. A police officer in civil dress at any time that a, an offense is committed in his presence has the right, just as any citizen has the right to effect an arrest, but then you have to immediately hand over to the nearest police station. Um, handcuffing of suspects, it's uh, in a situation where the person has committed a felonious offense, very rape, for instance, murder, causing harm. Yes, it's often necessary to do that. Or where the person violently resists arrest and you subdue him, you need to make sure. In effect, what you need to do is to look at the nature of offense committed. Not that when um, uh, Mina comes to complain that uh, you've given her a few slaps, then no, it's uh, to be an abuse. So you ought to look at the circumstances and make sure that it is absolutely necessary to ensure that you secure the person. Mm -hmm. um, the issue of civil cases, I think this is one of the highlights of uh, the recent lunch by the police um, to reaffirm confidence in the, po uh, in the police. The IGP has said it specifically that police has no business in civil matters. And that is it. We do that a lot. You see quite a number of uh, policemen chasing death. Getting into, yes, it's absolutely wrong. God and so me. we, are, I, I am saying it publicly, mm -hmm. when it is that a police officer comes to you that as he as he has come to complain that you owe him or her and so come with me, please resist it. We have no business. You're hearing it. This is we, very important information. We have no business in that. But interestingly, it is one of the areas where you get members of the public relying so much on the police. I don't know. But then the police administration has made it abundantly clear that please stay away from civil cases. 5 a.m. Bang, 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 bang on yes. your door. <laughs> you see, ah, that, that's, so that's, we want citizens the to live up to their rights <laughs> and resist it. Tell the police uh, officer, please, I'm not coming. This has nothing to do with the police. It's that simple. And don't go. Don't go. If it takes you, in most cases, what some police officers do is that when they take you to the station, if the, your superiors lack effective supervision mm -hmm. you are in trouble it is only when the superiors get to know that they are able to sometimes stop it sometimes too, it could be done with the blessing of a, a senior mm -hmm. uh, police officer but nevertheless the bottom line is that it is unauthorized I see. it is for this reason that uh, these are inspection and monitoring units it's one of the things they do very much. They just get to a police station charge office, check the number of suspects. We have um, a documentation system, sales register. They ch check, mention names, and sometimes you will get somebody, you, at the end of the day, somebody says, me di And so the, then the, the, the secret comes out you would most often find that such a person is there based on irrelevant issues, not police related. And when they find such things, action is taken. Now they formed units like somebody yes. answered rightly. Okay. Yes, it used to be the Amod Car Squadron. Mm -hmm. And um, currently, the United Nations has an agenda to ensure that policing is done democratically. In fact, with emphasis on respect for human rights. And so we are now weaning ourselves of the militarization of police systems. Mm -hmm. We don't want to be the friends of the public that uh, we have. And so basically the functions of the, poli uh, the formed police unit, it's the core function of the, police, uh, of the police, protection of life and property, public order management, 
is one of the very key functions of the foreign police unit. We have trained personnel who are very com uh, competent in hostage negotiation and rescue. We also have a, a system we call protection for vulnerable persons and places. Mm -hmm. we, we have structured it in such a way that we have pockets of units who, uh, that will be responsible for this. We are responsible for VIP escort and VIP uh, protection, as well as convoy security, human security, communication and information management is one of the key things. And then um, explosive, uh, we have explosive um, experts who can detect and then uh, detonate any ex explosive that is planted somewhere to cause any mayhem. Yes, and then uh, we also provide security cover for our own colleagues to enable them undertake operations okay. in the country as well as outside. Externally, when it is that we have our personnel there, we are there, we have the UN systems to actually patrol their areas of uh, jurisdiction. Well, so, yeah. in fact, uh, the operations of the unit is now based upon democratic policing with a human face, absolute respect for human rights. Coming to human rights, uh, Mina, obviously, Africa Regional Coordinator for uh, Commonwealth Human Rights Initiative. What is the number one abuse on human rights with relation to the police? What, which one is the number one? The number one abuse that I have found out with the police is bullying. Bullying. They bully their way through every single thing. When they are wrong, they bully you. When they are correcting you, they bully you. Every I have an experience yesterday. A police car, drunk driver, smashes into my car, destroys my car. An inspector gets out of the car, totally drunk, and the first thing he asks me, where's your license? So I showed him my license. Rather than, are you hurt? That didn't come at all. Where's your license? I showed him my license, and he's collecting the license. I go, no, I'm not giving you my license, and he flips. Um, then follow me to the police station. So I got very angry, and I told him, I told him, listen, you are drunk. You are a public officer. You're not supposed to be drunk. Yet, when I went to Odoko police station, because we were waiting for the MTTU to come, mm -hmm. I went to the Odoko police station, because the driver was drunk, and after smashing my car, he moved away, parked, and then moved again. And when he was moving, he nearly ran into a taxi, then moved on and went to climb a, a sand dune. We took, we took pictures of that. So we thought that for purposes of evidence, because if somebody is drunk and the next day you, 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 you look for him, the, the alcohol level would have gone down. So we went to an Odoko police station to... Um, report. And the officer we spoke to was totally indifferent. Very indifferent for the simple reason that that place is not the MTT. So if it's drunk driving and the policeman was coming to Odoko police station when he climbed that sand mm -hmm. dune. So for me, if you are saying that you are a friend of the, po uh, the, the people, you want me to consider you a friend and you are indifferent to me, you bully me because it started with bullying, I will not allow you to bully me. You go and report and even that the person is indifferent. Totally indifferent. And so by the time we got back the policeman had moved the car, parked it somewhere else and left the car. When the MTTU came back and followed up, the car was parked there but he wasn't there. So at the end of the day, even if there is going to be prosecution, you cannot prove the drunk, in, the drunk, uh, drink, uh, drunk driving bits. You can't. Because by the next morning, you cannot test the alcohol level. So if the, that is one thing, bullying. They bully you so much that your rights don't come in when it comes to bullying. I'm going to take a break. And when we come, I think it's going to get more sensitive. Because I also have one more story. And these little, little stories, is one that, this one bad apple is one that really condemns, you know, the whole unit. And how they are going to fish it out is going to be their prerogative for statute. Some of the sad stories which I think 
uh, makes the IGP thing, you know, let me rid my, uh, my force of these little bad nuts or these bad apples who are making the whole institution look bad. Is there an institutional problem or is it individual? Because I have a story where Mrs. Brooks gets arm robbed in the middle of the night drives to East Legon police station at about 3 a.m. and gets told that we don't report armed robbery case here, so drive to the next station. Her phones have been taken because obviously it's a robbery. And the only reason why she has a car is because the robber says, I can't drive a manual, so I have to take your automatic car. So her automatic car is gone. So she needs to drive to the next police station to report that, you know, I've had a robbery. By this time, the robbers are gone. And this, this is a fact. Now, after everything is said and done, she wants to produce reports to go to uh, her insurance to get her car paid and they see this says you have to pay me you know so it's like to add insult to you know these things detach the society you know from from the police so it's a good job you're trying to do these things but how i mean how are you going to get these single ones i mean how do you look at a lady you know in the middle of the night and say look we don't report i'm robbing case here so go somewhere else i mean it's, it's very cold if this really took place East at Legon. the police station, East Legon police station. No, then where else could uh, could she have gone? Well, they said they don't report uh, a robbery case. That right? can never be true. That can uh, you can report a robbery case to the single policeman you meet first, even on the street. And if he is unable to do anything, mm -hmm. it is his duty to assist you do what exactly you have to do. And so you cannot get to a police station and you find a police officer telling you we don't report yeah, so the nearest robbery, one rob, robbery cases here. And then you say further on, she yeah. goes in to ask for the report. I, I wish uh, this had not come on air so that we could pursue this matter very well. Because maybe now uh, whoever is concerned would uh, be finding ways to cover up well, this is the, 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 and factual. these are some of the shortfalls that we have created avenues that when it is that any citizen finds himself or herself embedded in such problems please go to the appropriate police authorities and report pips are there they are ever ready to assist and this is one of the things the police will normally say frank is <laughs> oh, and report, and it's a very fine case for us. <laughs> See, but she sits down in the comfort of her home and cries over it. No, I think that attitude is not, uh, it's not the best for us. It will not help the system, it will not help the public. And so we need everybody on board. We have created the atmosphere. Just try it and see whether it works or not. I see. And uh, with, uh, I'm sure you wanted to comment about this drinking or suspected drinking case. Yes, I honestly, I would not uh, very much want to comment about her particular case because sure. uh, uh, these police officers are not here to rebut whatever mm -hmm. it is that she has said. Yeah. So it could be true or it could not be true or not exactly what happened. Mm -hmm. But nevertheless, uh, from here, of getting in touch with her and then uh, find out one or two things so that we can remedy any situation that it's not being done right. But then if that is the attitude that she really encountered, then there was a total unprofessional attitude by those police officers that she encountered. See, well, and another thing I find out, even though we all have you know, one, or two, one or two cases, 90 percent they said she said they said she said so it's become a perception there are people who probably have never encountered i mean honestly i don't remember the last time i had any problems where i had to give money to a police officer but i can give you twenty thousand stories of what people said they said as to whether it's true or not and it's up to you the police to really try to redeem now you have one minute to really give us assurance on how you're going to do this to assure us that no, as much as we are concerned the administration has put in place the structures that would enable us solve this cancer that we are faced with and so what we are asking for is the cooperation of members of the public mm -hmm. members of the public are the victims certainly not police officers mm -hmm. if anything police rather benefit 
and we are saying you no, know, it is wrong, let us know so we can assist you. But if we keep on uh, being speculative, uh, keeping our pain to ourselves, it will not help the situation. Please have recourse to the structures we have put in place, particularly the PIPs. It's there at all times. Again, our time is up again. I think we just have to have a whole dedicated channel for... <laughs> you can give me a last word. Yeah, I'll give you a last word. Yeah, I'll give you a last word before my director cuts me off. Oh, I'd like to say a big thank you to... I think I have to commend them. Mm -hmm. uh, Inspector Danso and Inspector Bismarck of Odoko MTTD. Now, mm -hmm. here it's MTTD okay. and not MTTU. I think that um, they've been fantastic in terms of... Now that's what we want yes, to hear. That's so I commend them hear. for the good work. And then I said that um, the key human rights abuse is bullying. I guess I need to say that it's hasty arrests and over-detention of suspects. Those are the key things. That. In fact, the bullying, I mean, it's part of them, but the hasty arrest, before you can say, Jack, you've been arrested, and then you are over-detained. Well, hasty arrest you. could be swift action of the police. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> well, let me say good evening to little Maddy. You're watching all the way from London, enjoying the program too. Well, I think it's your bedtime now. <laughs> and I want to say thank you very much to Mina Mensa, uh, uh, Africa Regional Coordinator for Commonwealth and Human Rights Initiative, uh, Chief Superintendent Na Hamza Yakubu, who's also uh, the Kunkwa Naba, so the people of Kunkwa. Good evening to you too. Uh, your chief is making you proud, I am sure. And uh, we're talking about cleansing the police. We're not going to bring it back this week, but sooner I'm going to take one aspect and because the education is very important. If anybody owes you and turns up with a police officer, tell them to go away because you're not happy yet. You want to go back to sleep. It's your right. Thank you very much for watching. And as I say, tomorrow we'll be back to do it all over again.